Welcome to the Professional Rubricker Podcast. Welcome back to the Professional Rule Breaker Podcast. I have to say, today I am so excited for this show. This show is going to be something that you're going to need to watch over and over again because you know I'm all about breaking the rules to make a positive difference in your life and also in the life of others. And so my next guests, they're part of a dynamic duo, and they are the perfect example of thinking outside the box to serve humanity, going from rock bottom to greatness. And they have a story that I love of resilience, vision, and success. So my first half of the dynamic duo is Dr. Richard Carmona. He was homeless in Harlem. He dropped out of high school, joined the military, and became a combat decorated veteran. And he ended up in the White House. Yes, in the White House as the 17th Surgeon General of the United States of America. He's also a Vice Admiral, an MD, a fellow of the American College of Surgeons. He has a master's in public health. And as I mentioned, he's the former United States Surgeon General Commander, United States Public Health Services Commission Corps, United States Department of Health and Human Services. And I have to say, that's only a little bit of his credentials. And then his business partner, who I adore, is Judy Ben Asher. She was a guest on Oprah, in which they talked about forgiveness, about their shared experience with the surprise that they found in their family's DNA. She's an expert in DNA discovery, identity level trauma, and identity integration. She's an NLP practitioner and is an expert in mindset and manifestation. So you probably are asking, so why are these two people here? Well, they are working together on an upcoming podcast and a streaming project called Truth Seeker, a DNA discovery where they discuss DNA discovery, how to stay well during an active trauma and learn about all the science surrounding DNA. So I want to welcome to my podcast, Dr. Richard Carmona and Judy Ben Asher. I feel like I should have big applause, like the applause <laughs> machine going on here. <laughs> it's hard to follow him. Uh, I think next time, uh, yeah. Yeah, you go first, Judy, you go first. We're okay. <laughs> I have so many questions for both of you, like I really do, but I want to start first with you, Dr. Carmona. So I think it takes a lot of vision, perseverance, and grit to go from being homeless when you were a youth in Harlem to the White House. So tell me, I want to know your story. It's, it's so interesting. Well, um, I th if, if I had to sum it up in one word, uh, I'm my mother's son. She taught me to all the resilience, never give up, get an education. And even through the tough times, um, she was work nights uh, and she taught me how to be a leader. She said, when I'm not here, you have to watch your two brothers and your sister, make sure they go to bed on time, make sure they eat. And uh, my father wasn't always there. And so um, when I think, and Judy and I've had this discussion many times, when I think of how, why I'm the way I am today, the values I have, uh, the focus on um, seizing every opportunity, it was really my mother. Uh, my mother did not have any higher education, but uh, I, I'll tell you the story I used to talk to Judy about that Mom would sit at the table and in the little apartment we were in in Harlem, and it was roach infested. It was a single light bulb from the ceiling and a wire. And she would hold court with her children. 
And she, my brother would always tell me, we're going to be in trouble tonight. She was at the library today and she'd bring back books and she'd start questioning us about world events and talking to us about democracy, uh, talking to us about communism and naming different countries and people and asking, what do you know about that? And I was like, mom, I, you know, why? And she had this, little, she had only one person. She only had one dress. And she sometimes would take out, open her purse. And she said, this is the most important thing I have, except for you kids. It's my library card because it connects me to the world. And so she taught herself five languages. Okay. She knew more about geopolitics than most politicians. And I know that bar is very low, but you know, really she was an extraordinary person. And, and the older I get, the smarter she gets. Had I listened to her earlier, I probably wouldn't have worked so hard. So that's that's really where it all came from, uh, Kathy. And you know, she said things to me that I didn't understand for years later. Like I, I, Judy and I have had this conversation when I was just maybe 12. We're sitting around the table and we'd always get distracted because my brothers and I had this little game. When the roaches ran across the table, we'd flick them at each other. You know? <laughs> and my mother would say, stop doing that. Listen to what I'm telling you. And, <laughs> You see, one day, and I was the oldest, and I didn't realize it until later on, that because my father was really there, I really became kind of her, her confidant, her, her almost like her, uh, her guy. And she would speak to me about adult things, even though I was young. And the one thing that I always stuck with me that took me years to understand, so this is 1962. And we're having a talk about the world and communism and things and how unstable things were. And she said, Richard, I want to tell you something. And often she would switch languages and I would say, mom, I don't understand that. She said, precisely, you need to learn language and you need to learn culture. She said, when you're older, you'll understand this. The world will be a healthier, safer, more secure place when women have a seat, an equal seat at the table of leadership. I said, mom, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, 20, 30 years later, I, you know, it just kind of hit me. My God, she told me that when I was a kid. And now we're living it. It's playing out in front of us today. When you look at corporate boards, when you look at academics, the greater diversity, the more women on a board, you do better. It's just a different viewpoint. But an uneducated woman understood that and imparted that to me and her, my brothers and my sister. She was too young then. So that's where it all started. And so I have I had I can think of 100 conversations like that over the years where it was a gift to me that I didn't understand when I was very young. But as I get older, she gets smarter. Wow. It sounds like you had a very strong mama. Yep. Yeah. And even though you said she Talk was about genetics and, and that too, yeah. <laughs> but even though she was uneducated, she really wasn't. She was educated in the ways of the world and educated on how to raise her. Was it only boys Her boys? So, there's three boys and one girl. Okay. And, and, but she just, she, you know, it was clear her children were her most important thing. She worked at night. She came home in the day. She took a nap. She, you know, she did everything. You know, and my father was there sometimes, but he, he was a guy of the streets and nice man, really kind, loved. But, you know, the day he died, I realized it wasn't that usual father-son connection. I, I never really knew my father. I never went to a baseball game. I never took a vacation, never hung out with him. He was just there. And, and yet I don't have any negative feelings other than, the lack of a relationship taught me to be a better father. And so like my father never hugged me and, and it may have been the times. I mean, you know, he was, he was a veteran combat veteran from second world war. I don't know why, but he was always kind of distant, but yet he was so kind and nice. But now, because I always think, well, I never got a hug from him. He never said any, I, even my grown boys, I hugged them every time I see him. And I tell them I love them and, and the girls. And I probably am overly fatherly because of what I learned when that absence was there. And the world's best grandparent. <laughs> <laughs> That's my grandkids. I do spoil them. I do spoil them. And my daughter tells me all the time, dad, you cannot do that. <laughs> I, I hey, but isn't her, that what grandchildren are for? <laughs> yes, I tell her, I, you know, look, I tell her, I jokingly tell her, I said, look, I obviously failed with you. I'm going to try and make it up with my grandkids. <laughs> well, I have to say, you know, the things, the challenges that we go through life, it's what makes us who we are and it makes you stronger. It can, you know, if you go through a bunch of challenges, it can make you stronger. It gives you that wisdom 
in many cases that if you've had an easy life that maybe you wouldn't have had that but i love that your mom was talking about world events and different things like that that's something i've tried to do with my kids like i said i'm so excited for this podcast it's like i'm among people that are like me a rule breaker but um i want to talk about because the two of you together is a little bit it's unusual right but i think everything always happens for a reason there's got to be like synchronicity or something so tell me how did you guys meet i'll i'll start that one Um, because we have a very we have a very um a very strong bond in a very weird way um and dr carmona first named it bashert and bashert surprised you (laughs) <laughs> blew my mind. I was like, what is he saying? Because Bashert is Yiddish and he's not Jewish. I'm Jewish. And it was just a really funny thing, an interesting thing, but he's always blowing my mind. So there you go. But so he used the word Bashert about our friendship. Um, and and it's this beautiful Yiddish word that means meant to be. And some people use it in a romantic love situation, um, but it's really just a deep um, a deep connection, a deep love, which we have for each other. And Dr. Carmona knew my family long, long before, like 20 years before he knew me uh, or more, maybe. Um, he uh, he knew my father and I'll let you talk about, I'll let you talk about that part. Well, um, it, I, I really, the reason I used that word, it was one of my fa- favorite words but again, I think back to my mother who taught us about our lineage. And in my background, there are Sephardic Jews from Southern Spain and Portugal. And so not that I knew of any, but but I was always interested, where did I come from? And my mom was the one that defined that for me and little words like that. And so when Judy and I were first having this conversation and you'll see why, that isn't it amazing, we got together and I said to Judy, it was Bashert. And she almost fell on the floor. She said, how did you know that? I said- "I did." <laughs> I said, because it was meant to be. And and so a quick summary of all of that, uh, besides, uh, you know, being uh, running the emergency medical system, the trauma system, being a trauma surgeon and a professor, I had another job. I was a police officer also. And and I and I was a SWAT team leader and I did search and rescue. That's and so, awesome. Yeah. And so, so um, how, and this may sound, well, how does that connect me to Judy? Well, One of the things as part of my job, I oversaw the air rescue, which was a state police helicopter that used to go rescue people, especially in Southern Arizona when people fall off cliffs and bad car accidents. And so we did law enforcement, medical transfer and and, uh, search and rescue operations. And so my children went to a school uh, uh, called Fruchtendler in Tucson. And turns out that Judy's brother was the assistant principal at the school. Okay. Wow. Really? (laughs) <laughs> but, I, but I didn't know her then. I just knew that there was this guy that was. This it gets sister. weird. Okay? And then <laughs> her father was a very well-known uh, internal medicine nephrologist doctor at Crosstown and another hospital. So her dad and I had met a number of times. We didn't work together, but I knew who he was. He knew how, how I was. Okay. So now all of this, all of a sudden comes together. One night was in the late nineties around 2000. You probably remember the exact date. And um, 92. And I was out at 92, was it? And I, I was out at dinner and I got a call from my air rescue team and said, hey, the St. Mary's helicopter uh, is was on its way to pick up a critical patient in a rural area and it, we lost it on radar. And there was a big snowstorm, it was cold. And so I was at a restaurant and I said, what are you guys doing? They said, we're gonna go take a search, but the helicopter we had was one that didn't have the right instrumentation, but they went to look anyway. And I said, look, I'll come down to headquarters just in case something happens and we have to do something. Uh, you know, I'll be there. So my wife drops me off and, and I go up and it turns out that they, they're coming back and they couldn't see. And I said, well, who's on there? And they said, oh, well, it's um, Susan Van Asher. It's, uh, and I said, Susie, that we trained. They said, yes. So her younger sister was one of our trainees, older, older sister, excuse me, yeah. one, of, one of our tra- trainees. In, her, in my mind, she's still that young girl. I know, in, me in too, yeah. You know, she was 26. Pretty, lovely, lovely young lady. And we trained her to be a flight nurse. Uh, we, we, we were a state helicopter from police, but because the private sector wanted to do it, we helped train them. So she was this flight nurse. 
and the helicopter was lost. So this went on for hours. And we, I, I, uh, a larger helicopter from the government was going to go out. And I said, I'll go with you guys. We searched. It was really a terrible windstorm and snow. You couldn't see anything, even with the, uh, with the um, electronic navigation. It was very good. So we had to sit down. We set up a base camp overnight. And around midnight that night, we got a call from FAA who said they have a, loca they have a trans transponder locator beacon in this area. And those usually don't go off unless an aircraft crashes. So we started a search and rescue, but we couldn't do much because of the snow and the wind. And uh, the beacon was at about almost 9,000 feet on the side of a mountain covered with snow in a, in a blizzard. So as it goes on, the uh, again, and I didn't know Judy th at, at that point, uh, we, my partner and I, Tom Price, uh, we organized this incident command system. Uh, when the sun came up, we're circling and Tom was up at that point and I was on the ground and he called, he says, Rich, I see movement at a snowbank up near 8,900 8, feet, I think it was. And it was an arm in the snow. So we, we, we got together and decided how can we get there? It was impossible to walk to, you couldn't climb. So we decided to do a hover at hundred feet with the helicopter rappel in. You can't get too close because you'll cause an avalanche by the downdraft. So we had to stay far away, come down. And eventually, to make a long story short, we got in and unfortunately, uh, the flight nurse was dead, uh, the pilot was dead, and the medic we had trained, Glenn, was still alive. And he had critical injuries, but we had no equipment to get him out. So because I was I, I, about 185, 190 pounds, and my partner Tom is like 260, he's a big football player, and weight was a problem because of the wind and the 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 engine on the helicopter could only take so much hoist without redlining, like burning the engine out. So the pilot, a dear friend of ours, Vietnam combat pilot, really good. He said, I can only do one of you at a time. So we didn't have any equipment. So we decided, we picked Glenn up. Both his legs were broken. He was scalped, he was burned, jet fuel, but he was still alive. So um, we tied Glenn to my body, he used me as a stretcher. And so in two places, so he wouldn't spin. And then I put his head inside my flight suit and he, he knew me. So he said, what's going on, Rich? I said, I'll talk to you later. Put your head here. You, you, you know, I said, just hang with me, literally. And so then we gave the signal and then Lauren lifted us up on the helicopter like this until we're a couple hundred feet above the crash site, you know, and um, it was still the flight nurse. And it was a terrible situation. They were dead. The, the helicopters destroyed. They had crashed into the mountain at night because they lost direction and they probably hit it at over 100 miles an hour just exploded so then we're up above and then lauren just turned the helicopter and so he was he's so good we didn't swing or pendulum and then we had to fly oh five or six miles like that to get to the base camp and that's he's the hanging shot. outside of just yeah, to, we're, 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 we're just, the they're hanging dangling from the helicopter so then so we get glenn we get there and that's the shot that went live because CNN and all the networks were, we had to get air traffic control to move all the media helicopters because we were there overnight. So they were, every network was there taking pictures. And that's yeah. the shot that was on the TV that came across and they used it in a bunch of rescue programs after that. Well, and, and what, also when George W. Bush was swearing you in, that, that rescue went over air a lot. Yeah, there was, there was a few things. And so a couple of shootouts and other things that I got involved in. But but um, and that one, that's how we came to know each other, because shortly thereafter, when we went and recovered the bodies and I went to the funeral, uh, that's when I first met Judy and saw her dad. And, you know, because under these terrible circumstances and then then it was a few years we knew each other. And once in a while, we'd send an email or something. But then we found this common uh, interest in this DNA and genealogy and, and, and all of the secrets that it was unearthing. So we started having these conversations. Let's yeah, so I reached out, about this, you know, it was, it was so crazy. I, so I reached out to him. Um, so that happened in 92 and now it was 2019 and, and I was doing a documentary on, on healing and, and healthcare my mom had had cancer. And so I wanted to share what I was learning about uh, how to heal and how to manage stress and all these things. And I called that truth seeker. 
And I did a DNA test, um, hoping to find out if I had the BRCA gene, the BCRA gene or not. And, um, and I didn't, which was so great. That information was so good. And then, but I also found out that my dad wasn't my dad. And um, it was like, my sister was yelling at me to contact Dr. Carmona. It was like this loop of, I should reach out to Dr. Carmona. I should be like, it just wouldn't stop. So finally I sent him an email and we got on the phone. And by the end of that conversation, he, you know, we just had decided that there was this bigger picture that we needed to talk about. Cause if, if it was happening to me, it was happening to millions of people. I am, I am a drop in the ocean, you know, and, and it turns out that 26 million people in 2019, when I found out, according to MIT tech, uh, also found out that they weren't related to one or both parents. So that's how that started our conversation. And, and, and we, we just decided and really Judy was the lead on this said, you know, what can we do about this? Because the more and more genetic tests are done, the more and more people are going to get this, you know, genetic trauma, if you will, psychological trauma, finding out something that is devastating to them and their family members that they didn't know about. Mm -hmm. So we had a wonderful conversation because the first thing I said to Judy, well, I knew your dad and, and, and I know you. So what, how does that make you feel that you find out that that's not your biologic dad? But Judy was like, but he's still my dad. He loved me. Right. To, you know, so but that, those are the conversations we had. I said, yeah, but J Judy had great insight. She says, yeah, but everybody doesn't see it that way. It becomes very painful. It becomes mm -hmm. threatening. Families get divided. So we yeah. thought, you know, there's nobody addressing these issues. So again, Judy said, why don't we do a program and maybe be able to capture some of these stories and be able to help people through uh, these disastrous moments, what appear to be disastrous moments anyway, and, and the psychological trauma that they undergo. And interestingly, yeah. enough, a couple of years later, we get to just last year and we were talking. I said, Judy, you can't believe it. My grandmother, we were always told that she was adopted. My my grandfather had 27 children allegedly maybe it was more this guy was prolific and wow <laughs> and my grandmother but my grandmother who was his second wife had nine and so but and my grandmother only spoke spanish she didn't speak english and and so but i was oh you know when i'd ask questions they said oh your your grandma in spanish abuelita she's she was adopted i said oh wow yeah the nun there was this great story the nuns picked her up and, get, and got her to an orphanage and all this. And so this is what I grew up with. And then all of a sudden, my granddaughter and I are playing with Ancestry and 23andMe and looking at all this stuff. And we're pulling up the old birth records from my grandmother who was born in the 1880s or 70s, I think. And we're looking, and it was funny, we're looking at, and it was a marriage certificate. And it talks about Maria uh, uh, Anglada, uh, the natural child of... And I said, well, why would that birth certificate say natural child when that's assumed that that's the child? So we started doing research into the nomenclature and found out when the word natural child is used, it's because they can't identify the father. And as we dug deeper, we found out she was not adopted. She actually was what you'd call today an illegitimate child, but nobody talked about those things like back in, in those days. And, and what <laughs> prompted me was, the name Anglada, A-N-G-L-A-D-E, there was another family that was in Ancestry and they called me and said, hey, we see your grandmother's Anglada, we're Anglada, and we, our family grew up in the same town that she grew up in, and uh, it's, you said she was adopted, and my grandfather and grandmother had five adopted kids. I said, oh, maybe that's the connection. She said, no, but none of them were named Maria. So then I was like, okay, wow. So then I, I got their names, and then I dug even deeper and found out that 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 young lady and I probably are related because my uh, my grandmother's birth mother is her grandmother, okay? But it was listed as a natural childbirth because the father wasn't known at that time. So I, I called Judy. I said, you're not going to believe this. I said, and, yeah, and I said, it's not devastating to me. It's just very interesting, you know? But then when you really delve into uh, some of the sociology, anthropology, genetics, that it is very common that people just hid those things. They didn't tell anybody. They just buried the information. But yeah. when it comes out, at times it could be catastrophic. So I, I had a couple of conversations with this family who's in Denver, and it you know I didn't go any further with it, but it appears if that's correct, 
that we are kind of, you know, uh, connected 25, 50%, depending on how the genetics go. But I thought it was interesting, especially since Judy and I had been already having these conversations for a couple of years as to how to do something. Now, now something became evident in my family. Isn't that amazing? Like, I do believe that it's more common than we all think yeah. about yes. because so much was hidden, wasn't it? It's an amazing thing because when, so for Dr. Carmona, he didn't experience what I labeled um, as identity level trauma um, because there was no language around this. So we've created our own language. And I so, was gonna say, I, so what is that? That's what I want to so know. Identity What's your level definition trauma. of it? Of it. Yeah. So identity level trauma is when someone like me finds out that they, they are not who they think they are. And this can carry into many other groups, but right now we're just talking about DNA. We are going to talk about all the other groups because it's global mm -hmm. and there's a lot of identity level trauma going on. But with, when it comes to DNA and you find out that you are not related to the parents who raised you or the story that you knew, it can be devastating. And there's a suicide rate and there's a murder rate. And, and my feeling was we need to be of support. We need to be there to help people. Cause one of Dr. Carmona's first questions to me is, did you tell your father? And if you told him, how did you do it? Because we know my dad <laughs> is a very proud um, man, I don't want to say he has a God complex, but he's, he was a big <laughs> doc in it. And, you know, for 51 years, um, in, in Arizona and, and telling him was navigating a lot of things. Now I, I am blessed that I remembered in this moment that I actually had a degree in communication and I, and so I had a skill set that not everybody had, and it may or may not be helpful to anybody. But if I could tell someone and it made a change for them, then why wouldn't I do that? You know, I felt like I had to. I, I felt called um, to be of service in this way. Um, so that's one of the things we do is we help people navigate each conversation. Because if you're telling your parent they're not your parent, you don't know if they know. You don't know if that changes their entire relationship. You don't know if it'll give them a heart attack. Like there's all these things. It also affects religion. Um, for instance, I'm, I was raised Jewish. So one of the first calls I got was somebody who gifted me this information and told me that um, I couldn't be buried in a Jewish cemetery because I'm a bastard um, and there's Jewish law and, wow. and there's, there's, there's a lot with Catholicism. There's a lot of religious implications from finding out you're not, um, that you're legally a bastard, you know, or, um, from another mother, as we say. Wow. <laughs> it's, and, but the and, thing is, it's not your fault. Oh, so why no punish? And there's, there's no reason to punish, you but know, I think that person, that self-imposed, self there's guilt, you know, there's guilt. There's and, tremendous guilt, and, yeah. We had so many conversations about this, you know, well, what about the mother? What about the father? What about siblings? How did they take it? And and you can see where in some cases people just accept some people it's devastating, yeah. but that's when Judy had the idea. Nobody's doing this. Maybe we should pull this all together and maybe do a, a program that is complementary to some of the genealogy programs to, that, that's basically a logical follow on. Right. That's, once you find this information out, here are some of the things you may have to work through. And right. so this was her idea. And she then uh, reached out and asked me, hey, you want to do this with me? And I said, yeah, it sounds pretty cool. Let's have some fun. You know, so that's yeah. how it happened. And we're just trying to be of service. You know, I, I, Dr. Carmona's whole history is about being of service. I, I was taught from my dad, who's not my dad, um, that being of service is so important. It's always been part of my calling. And, and I have uh, my background in film and television started professionally in 94. And my, my, professional life in, in the holistic healthcare um, side started in 1990. So now I'm just kind of putting them together. And, and here we are, we're trying to talk about this without judgment in a very delicate way. We're not judging the parents for the decisions they made. We're just trying to be of service to the kids who are dealing yes. with the fallout, meaning the people with identity level trauma. So, so I call it patient zero. I am a patient zero. Patient zero is the one who got the DNA result, right? Um, 
but it's also my siblings that are going through this equally and the same as me. Um, it affects everybody. If your grandkids um, think you're a grandparent, but you're, but they also have a, a different biological set of grandparents. There's a lot of questions. There's, it just keeps going. It's, it's not you know what, you know a ripple really, effect, it's waves. I, I think what's really interesting too in our discussions, um, you know, there are many people that know, the majority of people know their genetic mom and dad, but you question, are they really functioning in that, in that role? Uh, what's mm -hmm. their relationship? So genetics doesn't necessarily assume that you're going to be a parent, a loving, caring, compassionate, empathetic parent. Exactly. And on the other hand, when, when you see Judy's case with her dad, who you'd never know it was different other than this DNA test because she loved him, he loved her, he treated her yeah. same. And so then it, it starts to become kind of difficult to wade through because what, what, what actually, the DNA says you have a genetic linkage, but is that all it takes to be a parent? For instance, right. you know, no, or, not or, at or, all. Or grandpa, no, you know, and it, it's it's the relationship, it's connecting, and so because the kids don't know the genetics, they know the person that loved them and hugged them and took them to the game and played with them and educated them. That's it, and that's what Judy found herself in. And so, I, much to her credit, that uh, she looked at this as an opportunity to try and bring some value to the population at large who must be struggling with this with the astronomical increase in genetic testing. Yeah, That's and true. it's it's been really fascinating um, journey so far. It's so triggering for so many people, um, even for the adoptees that I've met and parents. You know, I have friends. I'm 54. I have friends that are adopted parents, and some of them hadn't told their kids. Some had told their kids. It gets into a whole big discussion. What Dr. Carmona and I are talking about in this particular case is people who've taken a DNA test and found they weren't related to one or both parents. So um, we love adoptive parents. We It's it's a beautiful thing um, for anyone to love a child, right? It's it's such a gift. Um, and so we're, we're not going there. We're not talking about um, what the parents did or didn't do and all those wars that people like to go into. We're just trying to care for the people who are hurting. I have a lot of family that feels very strongly about me talking about this because it, they feel I'm besmirching my mother's memory. And my mom and I were very close. My mom and I, I feel are still very close, even though she's she passed in 2014. But I respect her, I admire her, and I like her. I don't just love her. And, um, and I understand why she did what she did. And I understand that there was never a time that would have been easy uh, for that conversation. So, um, I, but I have a lot of family who have basically cut me off and said that if I'm going to do this and especially talk about it for a living, that they're no longer wanting to be in my life. And, and I'm actually okay with that because I feel like I had so much opportunity to be surrounded by people who love me and help me through this. Like my husband, like a cousin in the family was just calling me every day, making sure I was, I was eating. And did you brush your teeth today? And have you taken a shower? Because when you're in a trauma, those things go by the wayside and that's when disease comes in. And, you know, are you eating healthy? Are you going for walks? Like people just check in on me. And I recognize that most of the population doesn't have that. People don't right. know how to have that conversation about this topic. People right. don't, um, know how to show up for people because this is a this is sort of a new conversation that we're having so we really want to get as far and wide as we can because it's global and mm -hmm. we it's guesstimated that it's around 56 million people now um, since 2019 have found out they're not related to one or both parent because there are I think now nine at home DNA kits and people will take a DNA test and find out who they are not related to, but they don't always find out who they are related to. It is a gift that what both of you are doing. So this brings me to the end of part one of this episode with my friends, Dr. Richard Carmona, the 17th Surgeon General of the United States of America, and my friend, Judy Ben Asher, who is a DNA expert. So just think about how these two got together. Like what they said, it's beshirt. It was meant 
to be and what great stories they both have. Dr. Carmona, obviously he has a lot of bravery, grit and tenacity, which got him from being homeless in Harlem all the way to the White House, as well as Judy going from being a voiceover actor for cartoons to now being a DNA expert with such a profound mission. So both of these individuals, they have such great unique skills. Just like you, you have some really great and unique skills that only you possess. So make sure that you use them, put them out in the world and cast a stone in a stream with your skills and watch the ripple effects and make a difference in the world like my two guests are certainly making. So be sure to catch us for part two of my interview with Dr. Carmona and Judy Ben Asher in the next episode. And don't forget to subscribe as well. And if you like what you heard, please give us a five star review. So again, go out there and make a difference in the world. And of course, be a rule breaker.